Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OWAS Dev Slop Show. I'm here with Tanya Jenka and Nicole Becker, my co host, and a few extra guests today. Let me bring them up on the screen. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Tanya. Hi, how's it going? Excellent. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. good. Hi, Nicole. Hi, guys. How are you? Good. And Lana. Uh, Lana is a special guest here. She's a developer friend of ours that um, is interested in this presentation. So I asked her to join us and maybe ask questions to our guest today. So let's go and introduce, go ahead and introduce Sasha. Uh, Sasha is a program manager at, uh, a product manager at GitHub. Uh, she's also the organizer, a co-organizer of Des DevOps Days Chicago and Delivery Conf. Um, you might have also seen her book. Uh, she published a book called Serverless Computing on, in Azure with .NET. Hi, Sasha. Hi. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Anything else you want to say no, about I yourself? No, I do have an intro slide in my presentation, so I'm just going to leave it for that, I guess. That's <laughs> awesome. Anything else before we get started? Should we go ahead? Yeah. Yeah? OK. Yeah. You have it. You can share your uh, screen when you're ready, Sasha. All right. So. Let's see. Can you all see it? I can see it and I'll bring that up. All right. And let me go full screen on here. Okay. So first of all, you're welcome to ask me any questions at any point. Um, and second of all, if you can't see, obviously let me know, or if you can't hear me or if anything, um, I made a couple of sacrifices to demo gods. So hopefully my demos also work. Um, and this is the presentation about securing your code with CodeQL. So first to kick off, um, I'm a developer by training, but I've done a bunch of other jobs. I kind of got into DevOps um, and I've done uh, solution architecture and in the cloud for a few years. Um, and I'm currently a product manager at GitHub. Before that, I used to work um, at Microsoft and you can find me on Twitter and on GitHub as Divine Ops. So if you want to um, reach out, then please, please feel free to ping me. Um, so before we talk about CodeQL, let's just set the stage a little bit. And I'm sure that everyone in this audience is familiar with um, the state of security today. But I have some numbers just to kind of underscore how really bad this is. So. We know that 53% of breaches today are caused by weaknesses in applications. Actually, most of the other ones are coming from configuration. So kind of mo most of threats are generated by weaknesses in code. And also, we know that the more code we write, the more security vulnerabilities we introduce. There's like a very strong correlation between lines of code and security threats. And we're basically, as an industry, are not getting better um, at protecting yourself against security breaches. And um, you can say that this is a security problem, right? So I'm a developer, so why should I worry about security? The problem here is that we literally have millions of developers and only thousands of security researchers. So we can't essentially just say, okay, um, you know, I, I wrote my code um, and then I just kind of gave it to security team and they will fix it. Um, because we have to sort of embed this process. If we're going to scale it, we have to shift security left. And I know everyone on this show talks a lot about shifting security left, but we also have some numbers to kind of back that up, right? It, it costs very little money to fix a security vulnerability where you're still in development stages, and it can literally cost you millions of dollars if you get all the way to the breach. And I've actually been involved in a couple of breach remediation efforts, and it's really, really scary how bad it gets um, when you actually get breached. So the obvious answer to all of this is to do some kind of code scanning, right? So we want to automate the code scanning um, so that we can catch these vulnerabilities like, um, earlier in the pipeline. But we also know that code scanning is still, still an aspiration. So according to data, um, only like 5% of all applications are scanned 
about weekly basis and less than 1% are scanned daily. And that's just of applications that are actually using static code analysis. So we can absolutely say that most people are not doing any code scanning at all. And then the, even those who are doing it are doing it maybe once or twice a year. So we're very, very far from the state where we actually want to be if we want to ship secure code to production. So of course, I'm going to talk about GitHub answer to this problem and how we can help developers all around the world solve this. So there's two portions to this presentation. One is code scanning and the other is code QL. So code scanning is essentially code QL as a service that we just introduced a few weeks ago. So we're going to talk about both on and then kind of deep dive into code QL itself. So CodeQL is a query-based semantic code engine. Um, it was created by a team of 30 people in Oxford, and it took 13 years of research to create the language. It treats your code as data. So this is a big um, point here that we kind of import your code as a database, and then we run some queries on this code um, to identify potential vulnerabilities. And then these queries can be customized. Um, and there is a community driven, so kind of everything that GitHub does wants to, uh, we want to be community based and community driven. Um, and so we um, allow people to submit their own queries. And of course, there's already a lot of like a couple thousands of existing queries that are written to identify uh, known CVEs and stuff like that. And then code scanning is essentially um, allowing you to run CodeQL in the cloud um, on GitHub hosted runners. And um, you can run the custom queries or community power queries. And you can basically, so code scanning also supports additional tools. And important to note that um, code scanning is free for open source projects. So you can run it um, in the cloud for free if you are developing, if you're a maintainer of an open source project. So. Basically, this is um, something that you can leverage um, and something that GitHub is trying to contribute to the community. Um, it's also important to mention that code scanning is right now in limited beta. So there's a wait list to sign up for um, getting access to the feature. And if you sign up for the wait list, and we'll have a link in the end to sign up, um, then you can ping me also. And I can try to make sure that you actually get in um, and get whitelisted for the feature. So. Code scanning essentially aims to automate the code review um, as part of your pull request flow. So you can run code scanning every time you submit a pull request. And then you can run it on every subsequent commit. So like if you made ch any changes to your pull request and also committed that code, it will run that there as well. And you can also run it on master periodically just to see like if a new vulnerability came out and there's now a query to identify it, for instance, you can then get that analysis as well. So um, first of all, is there any questions? And then I can dive into showing you how it works. It's so much worse than I thought, Sasha. <laughs> I hate how we always win. Oh, someone is asking though, um, is it planned to open source? Thank you, Adrian. Are you planning to open source this? So okay. open source what exactly? I guess it, if it's free, it's free, right? Right, it's free. So I um, the the action that runs code scanning is open source, um, and you can modify how it runs. I, we can talk about that um, as far as this. And the CodeQL libraries are also open source, so you can contribute your own queries to that community driven effort. All right, okay. I'm gonna. Quick Go, go Quick question. To, does, yeah, please. No, does it run as like a background process? Like, is it like, how does it actually execute? Like, yeah. Or so, maybe you'll go into that. I will go into that. So, let okay. me just, maybe that will kind of answer some of the questions. Um, so, I have a essentially a very simple JavaScript repository in here. Um, and so, um, I'm just, let me hide this. I'm probably getting this shared as well. Um, so I have a very simple uh, repository, and I'm just going to configure the code scanning to run on it. So I can go into Security tab and then click on Set up Code Scanning. And you will notice that there's multiple offers here available, and we're working on adding multiple um, additional partners. But for now, since we're going uh, talking about CodeQL, we're going to 
set up a workload with CodeQL. So this is a GitHub action that's configured to run on the GitHub hosted runner. And for most projects, this will just work out of the box. So if you configure this to auto build your project, it will just run the CodeQL check on it and it will give you the results. Um, in some cases, you need to modify it, which we're not going to go into here. But um, essentially, if you have like super custom build for your project, like in compiled languages, then you might need to add some steps in here. So I'm Sasha, just yes. Do you okay. mind making your your screen a bit bigger, or maybe the writing on the on your screen a bit bigger, if that's possible? All right. Yeah. So did that help? A little. If you can do it, maybe a couple points more. Okay. I, I'm just gonna get to the point where I'm 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 gonna stop seeing what I'm doing. Okay. But, okay. <laughs> this this is right. So basically, I'm just gonna commit this as it is right out of the box. I'm not even gonna configure anything on here. Okay. And I'm gonna in the don't do this at home. I'm gonna commit it straight into master. So now that it's committed, it's actually gonna run this workflow, but it's gonna pick it up at some point. So we don't want to wait for that. So I'm just going to switch to the same essentially repository where we already have this configured. So again, a very simple code repository for JavaScript. All it has right now is just this code. So you can see I'm breaking all, all the rules in here. There's some secrets in here that we probably shouldn't be checking in into a public repo. And then I've got a function. So OK, I was thinking about this function. It kind of seems too long. Um, I used to have this computer science teacher that said that every co every um, code document can be shortened by a line of code. So I just think I'm I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna shorten this by a line of code to kind of optimize it. Let's see if we can do that. All right, and then I'm I'm copy pasting code obviously because I could not get it right if I was typing it because it's kind of long. Um, but I'm going to add a, a couple of definitions in here. So I'm defining a database. Let's see if this works. So I'm defining a database, and then I'm defining an app using Express. So essentially, I can get input from um, external sources, and then I'm just calling an API. Um, so essentially, this is a call from external API that will then go and construct this query. As you can see, this is super vulnerable to um, SQL injection, because I am just getting out uh, input from external sources and just immediately calling it on the database uh, by using concatenation. So it's probably a bad idea. Again, don't do this at home. But if you do a demo of CodeQL, then please do. So I'm going to commit it to a new branch so we can do a pull request. And I'm going to do propose a change. All right. And then I'm going to create a pull request. So basically, you can see that because I have, go ahead. Oh, I just hiccuped. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't trying no, to get I your attention. Question, Thank you. Yeah, please feel <laughs> free to stop me at any point. OK, so this is great. Um, I have this configured, and it's running right now. So let's not wait for it to run. Let's just switch to another repo where it already ran. Um, so you can see I have some pull requests. I, by the way, I have some more secure, security alerts in here. I'm happy to talk about them if we have some time left. But I'm going to go into this pull request that we just did. Um, and I'm going to go into details. So it says failing after four seconds, three errors. Let's see what the errors really are. OK. So I've got three errors in here. And um, I'm going to start with actually the SQL injection one. So basically, it says, OK, database query is built from user controlled sources. right? And then I can also go into show path to see exactly where the code was. And I can also go into show, show more details. right? So I can see exactly what was happening in here. So it says, OK, if a database query is built from user provided data, Without sufficient standardization, a malicious user may be able to run malicious database queries. And then it goes again into recommendations. It will actually highlight the CPE that was known for this. Um, and it will go into providing you a good example of how, how you could sanitize the query as well. OK, question. So, yep, there is a question. Um, Adrian's asking, is it tied to GitHub Actions, or would it be possible for this to fail at Jenkins build? 
Yeah, so basically you can run CodeQL on your own servers, right? So basically you would need to deploy a server and configure it and set it up. Um, and then you can run it on any builds that you want. Um, in, in here, we're automatically running it on the repo. So it's configured on GitHub Actions on GitHub hosted runners. Is this also um, what that the cloud service is? Is that what you're using or the 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 one you mentioned that's hosted by GitHub in the cloud, the, yeah, the yeah, server? Yeah. So, so essentially, yes, I'm going to this is software as a service hosted in the cloud uh, yeah. hosted by GitHub that we're running. Yes. And this just so all it does is run um, CodeQL analysis on your repo using CodeQL, uh, using GitHub Actions, right? So essentially, we're taking the analysis that would normally run with CodeQL, and we're allowing you to run it very easily by just configuring a setting on your repo instead of having to set up a server and do all this work. We also kind of, if you are building an open source project, we're also giving you this compute time for free because we we are not charging open source projects for running this scan. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's yeah. kind of awesome. Yeah, so no reason not to be secure. Um, again, like I mentioned, it's in beta, so you have to sign up. So it's not going to be immediately available to you if you just go to your repos. But you can sign up for the waitlist, and then eventually, um, I can't say exactly what the date is, but in a few months, we're going to release this general feature. How does how does it handle false positives, or does it find? Is there a concept of false positives in? Yes. Yeah. So sure. absolutely, um, there is a concept of false positives. So what I can tell you is that we see that a lot of people who can figure CoQL to actually run accept the remediation. So this is kind of our Latmos test on whether or not it's it has a lot of false positives. But one thing that I can tell you is that in this particular case, so as you show path, um, in this particular case, if this query wasn't used anywhere, so if I had just this code, but I didn't have this part where it's getting called from user sources, it wouldn't actually flag it. So the CoQL query is oh, smart wow. enough to yeah. identify that there's a data flow through the code and this thing is actually getting used. Wow, that's smarter than like other commercial static analysis yes. tool. All right, I'm going to not say I think so. I, well, obviously I'm biased, but I think it's yeah. kind of revolutionary in the in the things that it does and it's also we're going to get into that, but it's also amazing that you can actually write these queries by yourself. So you could if you had like different uh, types of vulnerabilities that you wanted to identify are different. So the other thing that I want to mention is it's not just vulnerabilities. It also has, um, oh no, this was the right <clears throat> one. Let's do incorrect suffix check. So it also identifies potential bugs. So what, like in, in terms of the queries, you can write the, write the queries to do different things. And it doesn't have to be attached to a CVE. You can also write something. So in this case, the suffix checks is missing lens comparison. And then if you go into more details, it will actually tell you that, OK, um, if the expression is evaluated into minus 1, it will actually return true this, despite the fact that there's no substring. So it was supposed to be a substring and just with for x and y, right? And it actually will return an incorrect result um, in this particular case if we evaluate two minus one. So did I know that? No, before this flagged it for me, I didn't. Um, but now I can actually easily remediate this bug as well. Cool. Does it map to like CVSS? So unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, just curious. Oh, looks like there's another question. Um, yeah. D Didar, Didar. I hope I didn't mess that up. I could have. So any repo. So his question or her question is: Does any repo hosted on GitHub can they use this for free, or do we need to add it to Actions? Yeah, so you can use this for free for public repos. But again, this will be available generally available in a few months, and for now, you have to sign up for the beta. All right, I'm gonna, unless there's any more questions, I'm gonna go back into the slides. Will you share a link to your project for I, what you already did? Yes, 
so the 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 project right now um <laughs> is a private repo oh. but i will share i will share links to different things different documentation on okay. it cool thank you all right so let's go back into this and i'm going to try to bring my notes back which never works for google slides right okay Go full screen. Awesome. All right. So we had the demo, but let's talk about CodeQL as a language. So again, code scanning, in this case, we ran CodeQL. We could have run some other code analysis engine, but we're running CodeQL, which is actually a new language, um, a new query language that you can use to query your code as if it were data. So. First question is like, why did we need a new language, right? There's a lot of languages out there. Well, it's kind of different from what's existing. So the language is, first of all, it's logical. So you use logic to identify certain um, cases. It's declarative. So there's no um, functional flow, imperative flow, right? There's no if else statements. It's just declaring the result that you want to see. It is object oriented, so it allows you to define classes and extend classes. And it's actually read only, so it's it's an interesting language in a, in the fact that you can't actually um, modify. So if you extend a class, for instance, you you can only um, restrict the results and not modify the results. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. And then your database is also read only. So your database in this case is imported code, right? And once you imported the code, it's read only. And if you wanted to run the check again, basically you would have to modify your code and then import it as database again. But again, in, in terms of code scanning, it abstracts it away from you. But if you had to run it, say, locally, then you would have to go through that. <clears throat> and then, of course, it comes equipped with the rich set of standard libraries, which is how it gets really powerful. So what does a query look like? So a query, basically, this is a basic query for um, CodeQL. So you first import a standard, standard library, standard CodeQL library for this language, right? So in this case, we're doing import JavaScript because we're doing JavaScript, but we could also, there's a number of languages that are supported. Um, and then you basically uh, declare your variables. So these in, in this, so you can see that the query kind of looks like SQL. So if you're familiar with SQL, you can probably follow the flow of this. Um, so your from statement actually declares variables. So these are existing types and types basically define the sets of values. So if statement refers to all the if statements in your code and block refers to all the blocks that are in your code. So basically curly braces typically is a block. So CodeQL, when you call this, CodeQL will find all the if statements, in this case, all the blocks, right? And then we say where, where we uh, produce some type of restriction on the value. So basically I will say block equals if statement where get, uh, get then. So if you have an if statement and it has a then statement, this block is now assigned, uh, this block is now restricted to um, the then statement. And then you have uh, an ability to create an and statement. And then I'm also saying, okay, I want the number of statements here in this block to be zero. So basically what I'm returning with a select is a statement um, that has an empty then block. Right? So we can kind of see, even though we may not know the language, we can kind of see this logic um, happening here. So you basically start with an if statement and then you um, restrict the values that will be returned. Right? So you start with all of them and then you said, okay, it has a get then, then we want to look at the get then, and then we want to look at only the empty ones. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, someone someone's asking if there's some sort of AI being used in the background to make some of the determinations that it's making. Um, I would assume that this is the tool that is making the term determination. So it is a language that is implementing, um, you're implementing a query that we then run on code. And so the language is, you can call it AI if you want, um, the language is optimizing the query. So basically you write it in a human readable format, but the language optimizes it to run in the most efficient way. Cool, Leo. Very, very cool. Our, and and oh, another, go ahead. 
Yeah, just uh, is there a language support guide? Like what languages are supported by? Yeah, so tool? there's a language language support guide um, and there's a bunch of different resources. There's free courses um, and then um, there's this PDF and there's a workshop that I'm gonna give you links to that you can just look at um, how to do this. Um, and obviously you kind of need to know the language to be very productive with it, but um, the workshop and the CTF kind of get, get, gives you the taste of how to build these things. And what languages does it actually support as well? Like you're using JavaScript, does it support yeah. C, C++, .NET? Yeah. So Sharp. there's C, C++, C Sharp, Java and JavaScript. And I, and I swear I wasn't repeating after you, that's the languages I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I can't think of others. There Wait, may be others. I yeah. actually I looked at the documentation yeah. before the presentation. So it also supports right. Go and Java, um, Python. That's All another right. one. Um, I, I was wondering, are, are these queries the same for every language? So it's just across the board or are there some features that are belong to specific languages? Yeah, so there's a static library for every language, and there is definitely certain types and, and features that belong to a language because some code that you can write in JavaScript, you couldn't write in Java and vice versa. Um, but so in this case, for instance, this code would work in both of them, uh, but there's definitely certain types of queries that would only work for one. Someone is asking if it's read only, then how can they modify or write the data? So which parts read only? Yeah, so basically what it says, this equal sign is not an assignment, it's an assertion. So what I'm doing here is I'm asserting that this block is an if statement that has a get then, right? Uh, that is a get then of the if statement, sorry, um, that is empty, right? So instead of assigning uh, values, I am actually just restricting the values that are returned. And essentially the format is always in this uh, format where you return a subset of values. So if I just said, okay, I have an if statement and then select that if statement, I would return all the if statements in the code, but then I'm restricting that and constructing the types of values that I actually want to find. Cool, thank you. All right, I'm gonna continue a little bit and then we can uh, do more questions. So the building blocks of a query, so first of all, we have predicates in the language. So predicate is like a function, only it takes arguments and it always result, uh, returns a true or false. So it's kind of a declarative logic statement that will take arguments and tell you if the, if the statement is true. Um, so if we were to modify our query to use a predicate, um, we would essentially first define the logic and then use that logic in here. So basically what we're getting here is that I can then reuse that predicate instead of kind of keep repeating that those statements, I can now say, okay, I have like a function with a function name, right? So predicate um, with a name that I can then call and say, okay, where is empty if statement again then, right? So I first defined that I restricted the values of block to the empty block. And now I have this new way to identify that blocks are empty. And then I'm just returning the empty blocks in here. Then the other thing that we can do is we can have classes because it's object oriented. So we can both uh, take the standard library classes and we can also define some classes of our own. So when we define classes, we actually always extend a base class. So we can't create completely new classes. We have to have a base um, and then this is it looks like a constructor, but it essentially is logic to restrict um, the types of um, values that are returned. So basically I started with all the blocks in code, but now I'm restricting them to only the empty blocks. And the way I'm doing this is by creating this logic that will say the number of statements in here are zero, right? So again, I haven't defined a new value. I restricted the types of values that were selected. And then I can obviously use this on in my work uh, in my workload. So I can say if statement again then is an instance of an empty block, then I can return the if statement. So I can in this case we just wrote the same query essentially in three different variations, and we can um, do these constructs with um, the types of things that we have. So um, let's see. All right. 
yeah so this is the resources side i'm gonna get i'm gonna have it again at the very end please don't go there right now and start browsing because i'm gonna lose you um but essentially uh the demo is coming from uh a workshop that was given recently as part of github satellite so you can in this there was a workshop for javascript and for java so you can go and watch the workshop and it also comes with a repo again for javascript and for java that walks you through all the steps of building these queries if you are more into learning by doing you can start by a ctf so this also similar challenges I'm um, constructed as a CTF. So the current CTF that's happening is Java, but there's also former CTFs um, if you don't care about winning, um, but <clears> also <throat> just want to learn. So you can um, look at the CTF for JavaScript um, and kind of learn the same type of const constructs as part of a game. And then there's free courses, and then you can contribute queries um, into the project so other people in the community can leverage them. All right. So let's talk about, um, I'm just going to have a couple queries uh, to demo this. And so we're going to talk about finding cross-site scripting in jQuery. So before I do that, um, were there any questions on the stuff I had before? Cross-site scripting sucks. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so Sorry. someone was asking if there's support for JSP and servlet. And I was saying, I guess not, because it's not on the list. Yeah, I, I don't think so. And unfortunately, I um, I don't have information on like roadmap yeah. for that. So that's OK. You, again, you could reach out, and I could try to dig up the answer for you. Cool. Thank you. All right. So cross-site scripting is when you get um, some values from external input that might be tainted, um, and then you execute them. Right. And this syntax is kind of common in jQuery, which is an older, I guess, JavaScript library. I don't know, a few years in tech is old. So, you know, there's plenty of code out there that's written using jQuery. Um, and a lot of them actually have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. Now, the, the tough part of this is that um, this can trace all the way through your code and you can have it in so many places that you don't actually know and it's very hard to see that actually these text source selector it, at one point came from user input right you could you could be calling through multiple functions and then just getting it at the very end um and not knowing that it came from user input and then that right now you might be executing something that if an attacker were to use they could just have um uh, code that would um, essentially try to screw up your uh, application. So let's go and see kind of a demo of what we could do, how we could try to construct a query to find this. All right. So let me go in here and start sharing this. So we got that. OK, so first of all, I just want to say um, that I've imported a database here. So it's it's my local machine. I, I have my files and stuff. And um, I have a CodeQL plugin in my Visual Studio code that um, I installed. And then I imported a database. Database in this case, like we said a number of times, is code. So this is an implementation of Bootstrap, a previous version of Bootstrap. It's not currently active, but um, this is a number of versions ago that had some vulnerable jQuery code uh, that was vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So essentially, we're importing this. And now we're going to um, try to construct a query that's going to query this code and um, find the vulnerability. So I'm just going to start a new file here. It's going to be an empty file. Now, I have also downloaded, and if you were to go through the workshop or um, the, the courses, then they would teach you how to actually import um, all of these things and also get the repository. So kind of there's a repository called VS Code Starter. Um, so it comes with a standard library for the language. Um, so you can actually go and leverage the things that already exist in the standard library for JavaScript. So first thing I need to do here is import JavaScript library. All right. 
And then um, what I want to do is construct a very simple query just so we can see how it works. So I'm going to start from, and I know, and this is something you kind of need to read the documentation, or you can start guessing that it exists. But um, I know that there is a type called call expression, which is essentially kind of like all calls to a function. So I just want to return that. I'm not going to do any kind of logic in here. I'm just going to return that right away. And then I can also return an additional um, and a description for this. All right. So I did right click and I can do run query. So essentially, this is going to take. May I, may I pause yes. you for one second? Could yes. you zoom in? It's hard to see. All right. Sorry about that. It's OK. Thank you. We just want to know, you know what you're doing. Yeah. Can you see now? Wonderful. It looks gorgeous. Thank you. And now it's going to, OK, now I'm going to have to switch between the views because it's essentially too small. All right, let me try this. OK, so essentially, we can see that we found all these instances. And there's a lot of them, right? There's 8,000 of them in, in Bootstrap uh, code. They like call a function. So we can also actually browse to that and see what, what's going on. Uh, but essentially, I just wrote a query. Like this was a, was a code QL query. And it's not very smart. It's not doing ve anything very super advanced. Um, but you can see that it just returned um, all the functions in the code. So let's can make it more interesting. I'm not going to write it right here. Uh, I'm just going to walk you through a couple things. Um, so let me close this so we can see. Let me close this as well. All right, I'm going to run it first so we can give it a moment. All right, that actually worked really quickly. Yeah, let's go back here. OK, so again, we're importing JavaScript. And then we actually have two uh, variables here. So we are taking call expression and expression. Um, and then we're going to. Um, as say that the dollar arg, which is an expression, is a parameter of dollar call. So the dollar call is all the functions. So right now, we're just restricted it to be functions, kind of like in the same query. right? And then we, we're saying we're get arguments. And we could identify this if we didn't know what's happening in here. We could just say, OK, maybe there's a function called argument to a function, right? So I could start typing, and I could see that there's a, a whole bunch of different argument functions that, that are coming here. In this case, the one I'm going to leverage is get argument at 0, which is the first one, which is kind of what I wanted, right? And then I'm saying, OK, I want to find all the calls to jQuery dollar function, which have an argument, all right? so. How do I know that it's dollar call? Well, I'm going to say and. So remember, we can use and and or in here. So I'm going to say and and then say, OK, dollar call, get calling name. And again, I could start typing here and be like, OK, I think it has something with the name of the function, right? It, it should have some type of name function. So in this case, I found something that looks like what I need. Um, and I can say get calling name dollar. Right? And then I just return these function calls and then a description. So let's see. This was not the right results. Ah. Previously had. Ah. All right. Let, let me see if I can run this again so it can display the results. All right. So basically, I can have all the dollar calls here with a function, right? So I, in in just a couple of minutes, I was able to decide design a query that are displaying all the dollar calls in my JavaScript code, right? Which, again, I think it was relatively simple. But again, you had to sort of understand um, that these things exist in the code, right? So I needed to know um, that. It, call expression exists, and then I needed to find the right functions. But I could probably find it relatively easy by browsing the language documentation. Um, so what do you think? The, yeah, and these are like totally reusable. So if you have any other development or any other repo that has jQuery in it, you could then just, this is your suite of jQuery QL tests, and you just kind of slap them on. Like, it would work like that, correct? 
Yes, and actually, so all the queries that are kind of basically known CVEs, they are already part of the star standard library. So when we are running the code scanning, it's actually leveraging all these queries, right? So you didn't have to define your own, right? So it is completely reusable. And once you've written it, you wow. can contribute it um, and keep reusing it. Question. So it comes out of the box. I'm sorry, one more question. It comes out of the box with like all of these standard sort of known issues that are tied to CVEs. And then you could extend that based on specific things that you might want to look for as well. And then opens it. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, I just have to make sure I heard that right. Is that is that just another import to get the um, the pre created uh, vulnerability scans? So this is an import for a standard library. So essentially, like these value types that I'm getting are from the standard library. And I could also import additional libraries. In fact, let me um, go to another query. So again, if you went through the full workshop, uh, which uh, would be significantly longer, um, we could the workshop kind of builds out these queries one by one and kind of constructs all the predicates and stuff. Uh, uh -huh. But since we have a short time. Um, and I don't think anyone's trying it at home right this moment. Um, I'm just going to walk you through kind of the end result. So essentially, I'm importing the JavaScript here. And here, I'm also importing the library that's called Dataflow, which will allow me to identify if there's a data flow. So remember how we talked that um, through, the, through the code? You might not even know that the like options came from the user because it was through like four different function calls before it got to the end. So this library actually allows us to identify all the types um, where there is a data flow from one node to another. And um, again, it's predefined, so you can essentially just import it as part of standard libraries um, and not worry about how it's implemented. Does this also handle third-party dependencies? So for instance, you said it's going to find things that are in CVEs, but does it actually scan, for instance, like the node modules folder? Does it look at that? Does it analyze any of that? So if you have code like that is open to you, right? So you, you kind of copy paste it or whatever yeah. it is, like imported the module and you can see the code. Yes, it will um, because it becomes part of your code database. But obviously, if you're important as a library, it doesn't do that. Okay. Um, and we have a different uh, feature called Dependabot, which is scanning uh, vulnerabilities. So basically, um, it identifies, I can show you that real quick too. Um, but it identifies known vulnerabilities um, in your dependencies, in your entire dependency tree, and basically even suggests a pull request to fix that. Is Dependabot um, just CVEs, or are there security researchers behind that that are also like adding to that database? So it's it's going to, let me just go here because I actually have it configured. All right, so dependency alerts are active in here, right? And then um, I can go into here, um, and it actually identified that there's a vulnerability in my code. So essentially, it says, OK, uh, I'm using a vulnerable version uh, you know, 411. And um, it suggests that I bump it to 421 or later. Um, and it's, it has an attached CVE. So we have um, GitHub uh, vulnerabilities database, and we also have um, you know, the, the common vulnerability database yeah. and like we're integrated with white source and a few other partners. Cool. So essentially taking all this data um, and reporting it to you. And the coolest part here, actually, it actually just created a pull request for me. Mm -hmm. So I can, instead of like doing all the work, I can just like choose to work. Yes. <laughs> vulnerability. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, let's go back to our query. So this is significantly like more involved. Um, basically, what it does is there's a class called configuration um, in the library called taint tracking, um, which is essentially taint tracking allows you to uh, track tainted data through like um, the code flow and also manipulation. So like if you um, concatenate two strings that are like one of them came from user input, you probably still, t your data is probably still tainted. So this kind of implements it behind the scenes um, to find such a thing. And so I'm extending the class configuration from here. And then it has two predicates, one <laughs> is source and the other is, is sync. 
And so basically it says, okay, it has a source node from which the tainted data came, right? And then it had a sync in which the, the actual code is executed in the end. Um, let me actually run this so we can get the results because it might take a minute. Um, yeah, it's working really fast for you all. <laughs> so basically then I'm, again, the same way we did before, I'm restricting um, the, um, the, the types of the function nodes that I'm gonna find as a source and then the types of function nodes that I'm gonna find as uh, the uh, sync. And then I have this essentially uh, function predicate, sorry. <clears throat> okay, someone asked a question while well, I drink water. Or not. Um, I, actually, there is a question from Carl right. Hugo. So can we store queries in one repo, but then use them to scan another repo? Yeah, so essentially you are defining the queries on in a repository and then yes, you can run the queries on different code. Cool, thank you. So, okay, so there's a predicate that says has float path and it identifies um, all the instances in code that um, have a path flow from source to sync, right? And then it will return the results and return a couple other things. So it's well formatted. So let's see the results. So actually you can see that there's significantly less results in here. So we can see, go to this, oh, man, it's hard with big windows. Um, so we can see that this is indeed uh, someplace where the options target is being used, right? But how do we know where it actually came from? Well actually we can see the entire path through the function where it first came from user input right so it first came from this plugin options which was actually available to user which you could input data in by manipulating the dom and then it kind of went through all these different iterations in code well finally it got to a point where it got executed now trying to go into bootstrap implementation and find this flow path by yourself would be extremely, extremely hard, right? Um, but with CodeQL, we were able to construct a query and this is almost the type, this query is almost, oh man, I have to find it. Nope, is almost the way the query would look in the end um, if you had it, right? So this is kind of almost production ready query um, that identifies tainted data flow. And you can see that it's actually not that um, hard. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's super easy because you need to know all these things about the language and what types it has and what kind of um, things you're able to use predicates for and stuff like that. But in the end, it, it's not actually um, that complicated to write these. And again, the biggest advantage is you don't have do even have to write these. You can leverage the ones that already exist. So. I'm gonna go back into slides and then I will pause for questions. Any questions, anyone? Oh, everyone seems like really happy in the stream. Like <laughs> you're just doing awesome. I don't I don't wanna take up too much time because I think we have like 15 minutes left. Yeah, um, the, I don't the have data... more slides, so you know this is basically okay. it. So, <laughs> um, the database that you're querying, because you were saying the code is the database, but I'm assuming that there's actually a database that we're querying. No, so this is oh. actually imagine that I took all my code from my repo, and this is my database, right? So I'm essentially just querying my code. So there's no compiled state that this language takes it into that is being so, queried. It's just. So it, it has no, yeah. The, when I refer to a database is just your code. Huh, cool. <laughs> awesome. So swag slides, um, you know, there's more CVs than identified by CoQL um, in the last couple of years than any other static code analysis tool. Um, and this is, again, just cool by the numbers, like there's 20,000 public repos that have enabled automated code QL scanning. Um, and that was before we even introduced it as sort of the code scanning feature that you could configure easily. Um, which kind of tells you that 
again, one of the biggest problems with static code analysis is there's a lot of false positives, a lot of noise. And so people don't like to actually see the reports because they're super complicated and very hard to process. Um, so we are kind of we are seeing that 72 percent of people actually fix the vulnerabilities discovered with CoreQL, which is kind of our uh, understanding is that most of them are real if they're getting fixed, right? Um, so that's it. Um, you can sign up for code scanning beta and enable it on your repositories. This is the short link, so it's github.co, not github.com. Um, but you can also Google for it and find it in features and then go uh, sign up for the waitlist. Please uh, reach out to me. Twitter is the easiest way. Uh, if you want to get whitelisted, I will try to get it, um, get you whitelisted. Is this going to wind up in enterprise plans and all the yes, self-hosted of GitHub? Okay. Of course. Uh, so, of course, it will be in enterprise, uh, in GitHub Enterprise. And um, you will, uh, obviously, we'll charge enterprise for it, but uh, it will continue being free for open source. So cool. So cool. Whoa. This is yeah. really great, Sasha. I yes. like it. Yeah. That was a great if anyone wants to like take sorry, take a screenshot of the slides. So there's a bunch of links to other things that you can learn. And you can go if you go through the CTFR workshop, you will essentially end in, end up constructing the same queries that I talked about. And that's it. Um, and we can talk for I think nine more minutes about very <laughs> Woo! Yay! Good timing. <laughs> no, um, all those links that you provided, I'll make sure to add them um, in the description uh, after the show. So no worries about that if you didn't take a, a screenshot or anything like that. I also read that you added uh, that GitHub added CodeQL to the bounty program. Do you have? Do you know anything about that? So I actually don't have any details on that. So sorry, <laughs> I won't no. be able to share with you. That's okay. But from my understanding, you guys, I'll add the link oh. as well, is that uh, if they find uh, a query um, that, that finds new vulnerabilities, I think there's a price attached to that. But uh, I'll send the link. I'll put the link in the description. So all those it's bounty cool. hunters that were there for the for Kitty show last last time might be interested in that. Um, so there's a there's another question. Will the enterprise version of this have more features and then the open source free version have less features? No, so essentially it, it's not how we do things. We just basically expose the same features to enterprise and open source. The, the only thing is that you, you have to be open source, right? You have to be willing to share your code with other people to get the free um, offering. Cool. Do you know if there are more languages, like support for more languages on the roadmap? It's okay if you can't tell us, but yeah, there, there is, but I wouldn't be able to tell you what exactly we're working on. I actually should have done my research and um, come more prepared okay. on the languages. I should have anticipated that there's a bunch of questions about languages. <laughs> um, so someone was saying they didn't know much about the no database coding. Can you like overview that briefly? The no database coding? So I kind of don't understand the question. Yeah. So the person was saying, but I don't know much about no database coding. Could you explain it a bit? Um, Vina Yak, if you could clarify your question a bit, that would help. Um, but that is the last question uh, in the okay. chat. And so unless we hear from Vinayak, then um, we're probably good. I don't understand the question either. I think it. I might have confused the person with my question because um, uh, I was asking if there was actually a database that the program creates that you query, but those queries are just for the, what we just saw. So like finding paths in the code um, so I'm assuming that all the apps you would scan with this could have a database, but that's like separate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so it wouldn't it wouldn't go scan your database. It would scan your code, right? So basically, yeah, I guess the use of the word like database is confusing. Your database is essentially just your code base. So kind of your repo, or in in my case, on you know on my local, I just imported the implementation of Bootstrap. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at the um, capture the flags for this, and the current one that's out now is in Java, and it's on an old version of the Netflix, um, like a Netflix code, some code from Netflix. <laughs> so um, yeah. that looks interesting. The last yeah, one is so JavaScript, I think. You can go hunt for CVs inside of, uh, you know, Netflix Java code. And, and so we had a number of, so JavaScript and I think C um, and a couple others, it's the past CTF. So you can still do them. It's just not a game anymore. I personally, I like to learn from like doing rather than just being told. So CTFs are a very cool way to do that. So yesterday I was looking at OWASP um, Summit going on in a few weeks. And I think Sasha, you're participating in giving a workshop on, on CodeQL and GitHub Actions. Is that? I know it's a new new thing um, that's happening now um, that just you know um, just happened. But yes, I'm going to be doing a workshop. So if you all like, um, actually give me feedback. Um, I will definitely talk through actions and you know how you set up actions and how you can use them. Um, and I want to talk about CoQL as well. So give me feedback. What was the most valuable and what should I kind of dive into more? So yeah, I invite everyone to go check out the, I'll add that to the links as well, the, the summit that OWASP is, is organizing in a few weeks. Uh, there's this presentation, uh, there's that uh, workshop, but there's a bunch of other things uh, for free for members of OWASP and, um, and for very cheap if you're not a member. So yeah, check that out. There's one more question. Um, are the CVEs data included in the CodeQL server or is that, data a github property so it's essentially when you get when you configure a server you get access to all the queries uh that are existing in the standard libraries yes cool awesome sauce this has been great yeah <laughs> thank thank you so much sasha you're awesome yeah. and this is awesome <laughs> good cool so, I, this feels like a big game changer i don't know maybe i'm just oh yeah no it's I awesome so. like, i, I yeah. really hope so I am super happy to be on this show, by the way. This is not every day that you get to talk to awesome ladies in security and, you know, just, just I don't know. We talked about haircuts. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> that was off camera, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. No, we're happy to have you here, and that was great. Thank you for everybody in the chat. I think you guys make um, the show great. I think when you have a an opportunity to attend live, it's fun because you can ask your question and interact with you. So yeah, for our next show, I think it's on June fourteenth. Um, so subscribe to the channel, uh, hit that bell to get notification, and we'll have much uh, more show planned for you for the next few few months. And again, thank you, Sasha. If anybody else has some closing word before we we end. Like thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Nancy. This was wonderful to get to ask yeah, questions and be yeah, here. Yeah, you had great questions as well. And thank you for accepting and being here. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you for organizing, Nancy. Oh, my yeah. pleasure. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, great. That was it. And we'll end the show on that. And uh, like I said, I'll see, we'll see you in, on June 14 when we'll be talking logging and monitoring um, on AWS. So check out our meetup page, our, our Twitter, our LinkedIn. We're a bit everywhere on social media. So have a good one, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.